without fearing that he was missing out on something. Um, and so this idea was that he was, because he had a secure sense in his personal identity, he was able to do things that he wouldn't have been able to do if he'd been fearful about his identity. This would be equivalent to someone who get, climbs up in the business corporate world who doesn't have a problem going and mopping the floor and wondering what people are going to think of him. Or that if he goes to a convention where there's other, all these other CEOs, that if something spills, he would go get the mop and mop it up while all the other CEOs saying, well, that's a custodian's work. That's beneath me. So they're servants to do that. But see, you are free to serve when you have a secure sense of who you are. But if you don't have a secure sense of who you are, then you're not free to serve. Because what will people think of you? They might not respect you as much. They might not... See, if, if I'm not secure in who I am, then suddenly I can easily become manipulated by your opinion of me, by my own personal fears, my own sense of identity. But because Jesus understood that he had his identity as God, and it was affirmed by the Father, and because he trusted that God was going to meet his needs, the Father was going to meet his needs as he lived out the human life on earth, Jesus was now able to enter into this world and embrace the Father's mission, not worried about anything else. Not worried about anything else at all. And so it's kind of interesting that if Jesus, if you think about it, if Jesus didn't trust that the Father would meet his needs daily, would he really have been able to embrace this mission that was going to take him to the cross? Wasn't that the point of the temptation when he's in the wilderness for 40 days, 40 nights, no food? His body physically is on the point of starvation. Satan comes along and says, turn the stone into bread. If, Je if Jesus was was fearful that the Father would not meet his needs, and that he then took those meeting his needs into his own hands, he would have turned that stone into bread. He would have submitted to Satan's agenda for his life and turned away from God's agenda and purpose for his life. See, the reason Jesus said no to turning the stone into bread was because the Father hadn't told him the fast was finished yet. The Father, through the Spirit, led him to be into the fast, into the wilderness to fast. The fast wasn't finished yet. Satan was trying to shortcut what God wanted to accomplish. But because Jesus went through this tempting time, he was able to say, Satan, it's not about my needs being met. It's about the Father's will being done. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And the words that came from the mouth of the God is that he has a mission for me to accomplish. And if he wants me to die in this wilderness as part of his mission, that's his issue. But I am not going to deny the Father and his love and his purpose for my life just to meet my own personal needs. And Jesus is actually able to put his personal needs second to what God wants to accomplish in his life. And because he's able to say God first, that freed Jesus from having to worry about any of his needs being met. I mean, if he wasn't worried at that point of almost complete starvation and death about God meeting his needs, now he can go through and do anything without worrying about whether God's going to meet his needs. And that's why he's able to say to the disciples in the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread, God. In other words, he's saying, He's telling the disciples when they're praying to the Father, Father, I'm just going to trust that you're going to give me what I need to live and to survive today to accomplish what you want me to accomplish. God, I am not going to fret about the daily bread. I'm going to trust that you'll give me my daily bread. And that daily bread was just a, a symbolic statement of everything I need for life. And so what Jesus is telling his disciples is, is essentially the same thing. Guys, Trust God to meet your needs, and that will bring this incredible freedom into your life that you are now free to serve and not make stress or be anxious about whether your personal expectations, your personal needs are being met. And this is really hard for us, isn't it? Because when I'm hungry, I want to have my needs met. I want to be able to walk into the kitchen, open up the fridge, and know that there's something there that I can munch on. Right? That's the cravings that, that we have. 
But you see, what God is saying is, if you'll just not focus on your cravings, if you'll just focus on my mission, I will take care of what you need. I will give you the food and clothing. And we've discussed this already. We discussed this last week. It's that God says, I'll give you what you need. Stop being anxious. Stop being worry consumed. Stop being fearful. And will you just be who I call you to be, just doing what I call you to do? But you know what? This insecurity in, in our lives, it, it is so incredibly subtle that we just often don't see it. There's this one story. It comes from Mark chapter 10. It says, then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus, and they said, teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. <laughs> now, is that a loaded question? <laughs> Can you imagine if your kids came up saying, mom, dad, will you just give me whatever I'm about to ask for? Have they ever tried to pull that one on you? You know, or you'd say, uh, just, just, we, we sometimes get this way, just give me a yes or no. Well, what's the question? Well, I'll tell you after. <laughs> Just tell me yes or no. I usually go with the no <laughs> to play it safe. But, but, you know, what James and John are coming, they're coming to Jesus. Jesus, we're going to ask you to do something and, and just say yes without us even telling you what it is up front. Jesus doesn't fall for that. He says, what do you want me to do for you? He said, well, he says, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. See, Jesus had been talking about the kingdom of God, how God was establishing his kingdom. And they pictured that Jesus at some point in time was going to be appointed as king over the kingdom and that he would rule over the house of Israel for the rest of eternity and that, that through his reign, God would set everything right. And they were thinking, man, wouldn't it be cool if when Jesus sets up his throne, if his two closest advisors, right, one on the right and one on the left, were sitting there right beside him, and wouldn't that be cool if that were us? And, and, and you've got to wonder, what's the drive behind the request? What are James and John really wanting at the soul of their being? Well, they want a place of significance, don't they? They want to know that they're important. They want to know that, that they have value and that they could be respected and that they would, could be honored and, and that everyone would look up to them and be envious and that maybe even others would serve them because isn't that the way it works in, 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 a, in a court, a king's court, is that, that the higher you up you are, the more people you have underneath you to serve you? So wouldn't you want to be at the top and so, so they come to Jesus because at, at the core of their being, there's this, this fear that maybe they're not significant, that they're not important, and they def desperately crave some sort of symbolic statement in their life to say, you have value. And they're looking for those value statements. And right now, as they're looking at it, they're, they're seeing that they would get that fulfilled and, and, and this is so compelling for them that they, they decide that they want to get this request into Jesus before any of the other disciples think of it. Right? And, and, and so, and, and they want to do it even before Jesus in his own mind starts to determine, hmm, who am I going to sit, have sit at my right and left when I'm establishing? And so they want to get in there before any decisions are made, and, and they want to just plant that seed and they, because they desperately want that that significance for themselves. At this point in time, they are not at all interested in serving others and doing what's best for the other disciples, um, but to have their own needs met. And, and this is going to create some problems. Well, Jesus continues on with the dialogue, and he says this. He says, you don't know what you're asking. You, guys, you really don't. He says, but can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with. And they're like, what in the world are you talking about, Jesus? Um, they're thinking, Jesus got baptized in water as sort of his declaration to the kingdom of God. And saying, yeah, we can do that. But, but the problem is Jesus was already baptized, and so were they. So what is Jesus talking about? Well, well Jesus obviously here isn't talking about water baptism. He's talking about being immersed, because the word baptism means immersion. 
He's, he's talking about being immersed into his death, his upcoming death. See, they have no clue that he's talking about his death, or they would never quite so quickly affirm that they can go through what he's about to go through. But see, Jesus is saying to him, saying, are you really willing, in this pursuit of a place of significance, are you really willing to follow the path that I'm willing to follow? And my path, would, Jesus would be saying, it would be complete surrender to the will of God that's going to result in my torture and death. Now, do you think that's what they're thinking about when they're thinking about getting seats in glory? In the kingdom of God? Are they thinking about, about the pain and the suffering and the fact that you serve others to that extent? No, they're thinking about position. They're thinking about respect and, and all that goes with that. So they naively say, to that request statement, yes, we can. <laughs> they answered them. Jesus said, oh yeah, you will drink the cup I drink. Um, and you will be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. See, Jesus knows what's going to happen down the road with him. He knows that each of his apostles, his disciples, the 12, are going to be put to death for their faith. They're going to be put to death because of how they chose to serve God and serve mankind. Or as we talked about last time, serve mankind with God. Serve with him as he serves mankind. And so Jesus gives a little bit of a prophetic statement to them. They don't get it all at this point in time. But the prophetic statement is, you are going to go through the type of baptism I'm about to go through. You will die in serving the kingdom of God. But he goes on and he says this, but to sit at my right or left, that's not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they've been prepared by the Father. And so what's interesting is they're not necessarily getting all this and neither are the other disciples as they're listening in. But the other disciples as they're listening into the, on, into on this conversation, guess what emotional reaction they're having? It says, when the ten heard about this, James and John request to be the two seated at, on their throne, they became indignant with James and John. Well, why were the other disciples so indignant? <laughs> because they wanted the positions for themselves, precisely. That they wanted to be up there. They, wanted, they just weren't audacious enough to go and actually boldly state it to, to Jesus himself. Uh, and the fact that James and John actually thought about doing it that ahead of them really ticked them off. Now, had they thought about actually going up with that request, they probably would have done it themselves. Because everybody is thinking about my needs of significance being met more so than, than what is good for the other person. I mean, isn't it interesting? Shouldn't they have been there cheering James and John on? Say, yeah, go, James and John. You deserve those positions. We want that for you. <laughs> they didn't give that response, though, did they? Um, why weren't they excited for James and John? Why couldn't they revel in someone else's success? Same reason why we find it hard to. Um, you've all had experiences in your life when someone else was chosen instead of you, haven't you? And I don't know whether it's just as a little kid on the playground when they're choosing teams and you weren't necessarily the first three chosen you're probably one of, maybe one of the last three chosen. And maybe you're the one where they said, okay, we'll take him if we have to. You know? And it just eats at the core of, your, of who you are. But, but we carry that into our adulthood too, where sometimes we aren't the one that was chosen. We didn't get the job. We didn't get the position. We didn't get the affirmation. And, and instead of being delighted for the other person, we refuse to be delighted and excited for them, and instead a, a root of bitterness crept into our life, a, a spirit of resentment. Uh, to the point where we were jealous and envious, and, and our significance was so called into question that we are incapable of joyfully serving that other person. We've all done it. We've all been there. I don't know if you can actually pinpoint a time in your life when, when that was the case. Um, I mean, we've had multiple times, right? I remember one time I was in a youth group as a youth, and, and, and they decided to, to have uh, a vote for who was going to lead the youth group, and, and, and this one guy was, was the only name that came forward. No one else volunteered. And, and I was thinking, oh, that guy would have to be horrendous being the lead of this youth group. And, and so I said, okay, 
I'll just throw my name in here as I find too. And, and so I came to the vote. I think I had like one vote and everyone else voted for this guy because of some of the dynamics that were going to, and, and you know, they're saying, <sighs> right? But at those times, it eats away a little bit at your significance, doesn't it? When you think, that other person didn't really deserve it, I actually deserved it. Should have gone my way. And we've all had those times. And the, the question is, how did you choose at that point in time to process your sin nature? And did you give in to the sin nature and allow bitterness and resentment to remain? And then as a result, and you know that happened because you were incapable of actually joyfully serving and building up that person. Fortunately, even as a youth at that point in time, my pride was wounded but at least God spoke into me and in saying, build the guy up, affirm him. Well, I'm not sure I went the full way, <laughs> but I, I at least supported. I supported the guy and, and I cheered him on. And, and I, I, I didn't speak negatively about stuff from that point forward. But, but, you know, I haven't always been successful at that. There have been times where, you know, that, that bitterness, that root, and, and, and maybe you don't actively do anything, but what you do stop doing is you stop actively thinking good about the person and you stop actively building up the person. You stop actively loving the other person. And it's showing that really I'm chained. I'm in bondage. I'm in bondage and I'm not free to serve because I'm still more consumed with my needs than I am about what's good for the other person. And this is what's happening with the other disciples. As they're looking at James and John Instead of being excited and cheering James and John on, saying, yeah, we'd love to see you in the position. You know, guys, you'd be great there. They became indignant, Scripture says. They became resentful. And, and you can imagine that that now started to create some relationship tensions, even amongst the 12. The team is now getting divided. Relationships are strained. No one is thinking about how they can serve the other. And the kingdom of God has just become hindered and less effectual. It's become ineffectual if it was to remain that way. These disciples, if they were going to continue on for God's purposes, had to get to a point of saying, not my purposes, God, what's your purposes? And just saying, Let, let's team together. And so I don't know how Jesus managed to do that in that little community of the 12, because there were some tensions that were now being experienced. And Jesus had to somehow work through the 12 if they were to be collectively together. To work through those emotional tensions so that they could stay a team. An effective team. And, and whenever we get into these situations where our emotional tensions start to rise. It is our God-given responsibility to think through what's going on in my life. What's being attacked in me. And think through how can I surrender that to God and how can I allow God to work with me and through me to love that other person who is not meeting my expectations? And, and that's a challenge that each of us will have in this coming week. To love others without strings attached. So Jesus continues on with the 12 and he wants to give them a little bit of perspective because he knows their perspective is way off course from what God's perspective is. And because their perspective is way off course, it's bringing hindrance to the kingdom of God, it's creating relationship divisions and tensions, and he wants to pull them back, and he's, he wants to pull them back by giving them a, a different understanding of how we should approach life. And listen to what he says. Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles, in other words, in the secular world, and in your businesses, and in your political communities, and wherever you go, that Gentiles, I mean, just the people, lord it over them. That this is the way of working. That high officials exercise, exercise authority over lower officials. That those are in position, see that they've got positions of authority and power and significance and respect. And they're going to then be over the others. And Jesus says, that's not how it works in my kingdom. If you're going to approach things that way, don't enter my kingdom. My kingdom is going to flip that on its head and approach it from a completely different angle. And, and he says, he goes on, he says, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve 
and to give his life as a ransom for many. In other words, Jesus says to each of us, are you really willing to give up your life to make other people's lives better? Are you willing to do that? Even if it comes as a personal sacrifice to you, if, it, if you have to even give your life to make other people's lives better, and especially in the eternal picture of them entering the kingdom of God and being with God through eternity, are you willing to give up your life so that they can experience eternity with you? Or are you going to fight for this world and this life and not even think about their eternal destiny? And Jesus says, in my kingdom, he says, we serve. I, the king of the kingdom, did not come to be served, but to serve. And who will ever be great in my kingdom. In other words, the ones who are going to seat, be seated on these positions are not the ones who are looking for position and significance. The ones who are seated in these seats are going to be the ones that grab the toilet brush and run to the toilet after a big conference has happened. <laughs> you know? You know, in, a, in the Walmart bathrooms and you know wherever you might be in my mind I picture New York City Central Park going down the stairs I don't know if you picture the movies where there's stairs that go down into this little covered way and then there's a, a, a fountain on the other side but going down to the stairs are the public washrooms and you walk into those public washrooms and you're saying don't touch a thing <laughs> And you just look around, and, and uh, I mean, was there, it, it was terrible. <laughs> and yet the servant would be saying, that's my job. I'll do it so nobody else has to. And, and so what Jesus is essentially saying here is that you can only truly serve when you are insecure in your worth and your identity and who God made you to be and in what he calls you to do, trusting that he'll meet whatever needs you have along the way, that, that only when you're able to give your life over to God and completely surrender to him, are at that point, are you completely free to serve without strings attached, without being controlled by unmet expectations, or without being controlled by fears. Only then are you truly free to serve. Only then can you become great. Only when you die to self, and pick up the toilet brush, can you become great in the kingdom of God? And so Jesus would be saying, you know, whenever there's a task that no one else wants to perform, be the first to volunteer so that nobody else has to do it. One of the things I, I really appreciate here at LifeBridge, um, in a unique way, is the Sunday morning setup teams. The reason for that is nobody would really identify that as their life calling or passion. You know, in every other ministry, people do it because there's some sort of interest in it. And, and, and like nursery, sure, you might do it, it might be hard, but, but for most of it, it's people because they enjoy children. Or, or like even in the sound or the media community, there's a joy with the technology. Or over here, when it comes to setup, I haven't met too many people that just, my life calling is just fulfilled when I set up chairs, <laughs> right? that I get up early before anyone else on a Sunday morning, and I schedule my life so I can be here at 8.20 to set up chairs. And what I love about setup team people is that you're saying, I'm willing to do what nobody else really wants to do so that they don't have to do it. Right? Is there any other statement that goes with it? I'm willing to do what nobody else wants to do just so that they don't have to do it. And it'll get done, and God will be glorified, because now everyone's getting to sit in a chair instead of standing this whole time. Right? You see, that's the servant heart. That, uh, that it's not just in that ministry. It's, it does get reflected in every ministry. In every ministry you're serving, you're serving because that's where God calls you to. I just highlight that one because it's, it's, it's one that usually not, nobody really wants to do. But, you know, Whatever God calls us to, he wants us saying, will you let go of your life and your agenda, your expectations, and even if everything's going chaotic around you, will you just be who I call you to be? And will you just do what I call you to do? And will you just love people? And will you just serve them? Will you just serve? And if so, you're becoming great in the kingdom of God. 
when, someone, when there's a chance for someone else to be promoted, and you'd like it to be you, but you see someone else also wants that same promotion, are you able to actually say, I don't need the promotion. I can cheer you on. You know, God's going to meet my needs regardless. So why don't you take the position? Yeah, I might not even think you'd be as good at it or whatever, but, but why don't you take the position because God's taken care of me. Why don't you just get the blessing of that? And, and, and so can we actually make a decision to be cheerful for people who get what we want? One of the things that helps, and I'll, this is just a passage I want to share in closing, and this, I, I share this because it really does help me on the practical level. Let me just read it. Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. Sea was a symbol, symbolic picture of chaos and danger and, and fear. He says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, I'm making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. This perspective is the foundational anchor point of my life. That if I keep it at the forefront of my mind, it affects everything I do. Because what it says is, Rob, why are you getting stressed? Everything's taken care of there. Everything God has already dealt with, every problem, every issue, every need, he's done it, he's finished, it's completed, it's there, and it's coming down the road, it's just waiting for us. So, so why are you getting anxious or worried about anything in this life when it's already all taken care of? And so I, I have this rule, and the rule is, if I'm not going to care about this issue 10 billion years from now, then I'm not allowed to be that concerned about it now. If I'm not going to be anxious 10 billion years from now or 1,000 years from now, looking back saying, oh yeah, I should have been more anxious about that. When everything is taken care of and God had a solution and resolved and he's going to meet my needs and he was going to care for me and he's going to do stuff through me, and why would I worry about that there when in the kingdom of heaven it's all taken care of? In other words, there's nothing I have to do here in order to make that happen. God's already told me it's going to happen. All I have to do now is not stress or manipulate or control. I just have to say, God, what do you want me to be here? Then until that happens, who do you want me to be? What do you want me to do? And that brings incredible freedom into my life. That means anything I'm anxious about, I can surrender to the future and to God's control. And I do this whenever I'm anxious. I come back saying, God, you know, forgive me. I confess that I am questioning my future. I'm questioning your control. I'm questioning your provision. I'm questioning your love, God. And so it's filling me things. Like, God, I surrender that. God, simply, what do you want me to do? And, and I, sometimes it takes more time to get to that point of peace than it does others. But if I focus on this truth and I focus on who God is and who God's, what role God has for me, it makes every fear and anxiety eventually dissolve. And it frees me then to do what God wants me to do as opposed to what my emotions would manipulate me to do. Do you get that? That the freedom of who God is and what he's already prepared for me frees me from ha having to let my feelings control and my feelings hinder me and my feelings render me ineffective and my feelings rob me of peace and joy. The truth about God and his future can bring a peace into my life right now where I just say, you know what, God, I'm not responsible to change any of this. I'm just responsible to be who you call me to be, doing what you call me to do, and me enjoying you in the process, and you loving others through me. God, so now in the midst of the circumstance, what do you want me to do to love others? I don't need to worry about position. I don't need to worry about finances. I don't need to worry about food. I don't need to worry about clothing. I don't need to. That's God's problem. 
And am I really, really willing to surrender that to him? What I want you to know is that in this, that you were created significantly. God tells you that in scripture. I know none of us believe it, really. But each one of us here is significant to God and to his purposes. And he has a role, that, a delightful, joyful, adventurous role for you to play in this world if you can just get in sync with him and, and what he says about you. That you are carefully created and loved by God and you still are. That you are created with a role to play and you still can. And that you are created to serve with God and he just wants you to go now and serve and so that's why we're encouraging weekly to do something to get beyond yourself, for me to get beyond myself. This past week, we encourage you to try and encourage something once a day. This week, we have an, another assignment. What, what is it? On your bullets, and says, oh, encourage someone with a small gift. I love small gifts. <laughs> um, is there someone you can encourage this week with a small gift? Maybe a Tim's card, maybe uh, flowers. Maybe. Is there someone who, who you think could use encouragement that you could encourage? Maybe they're hearing discouragement. Maybe you can bring encouragement. Think through your workplaces. Think through your school. Is there something that you could do just in? And when I say gift, I don't mean you necessarily have to go and buy some. I just, is there some tangible expression as opposed to just a word or a note? Is there some tangible expression you can use to try and encourage someone in this coming week? If so, maybe try and do that. Just find ways to get outside yourself and see how you can build up someone else because that's what the kingdom of God's all about. Why don't I pray? Father, <laughs> man, I, I can chat this stuff through, but Lord, this is stuff that's uh, equally challenging for me as it is for anyone in this room. And Lord, I just pray that you'd give me a greater sense of who you are and the future you have for me, and who my worth is. And Lord, I pray that for each one here. Lord, would you give each one here that sense of confidence that they are loved by you, that they're significant, and that you're going to take care of their needs. And now they are free to not be bound by fear, but just to serve others in fear and trepidation, even if necessary. But Lord, um, I just pray that you would do that work in us, that healing work in us, so that your church in this world could become even more powerful and more effective. I just pray that you do that. But Lord, we acknowledge that there's stuff in us that needs to be processed. There's stuff in us that needs to be worked through. Barriers that need to be brought down for us to get to that point. And just, would you help us process whatever needs to be processed? But thank you that you want to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. We are all going through stuff, whether it's personal stuff or relational stuff or spiritual stuff. We all have something going on in our lives. And uh, our instinct, our first nature is to keep that to ourselves and try and work through it on our own and process it on our own and, and keep it secret and hidden and no one else can know because, well, you know, what would they think of me if they knew? But um, God has given us community. He's given us family. And he's given us that because he doesn't want us to do that stuff alone. And so at LifeBridge, we've brought in Stephen Ministry. And we have Stephen Ministers here at LifeBridge for that purpose, to help you go through that stuff. It may be getting together just for a cup of coffee and working through the things that have been roaming around in your head for the last week or so. Or it may be getting together weekly 